In the summer of 1966, I was entrusted with the pleasant and responsible task of leading a two-months expedition in Western Mongolia, under the auspices of the Mongolian and Hungarian Academies of Science. Against a strong headwind, we reached this almost flat plateau at a height of 6,800 feet, and immediately saw, a few kilometers off, a group of animals galloping away from us at full speed. My Mongolian companion, Nam Hai Dorj Balgan, recognized them at once with the naked eye as Shavalsky wild horses, and subsequent observation with a telescope confirmed beyond any possible doubt that this was what they were. For about 20 minutes, we were able to follow them at a speed of about 25 miles an hour, but were never able to reduce the distance between us. We followed them for about six to eight miles over quite open ground and observed them by telescope until they disappeared. A stallion racing at the rear and separated from the others occasionally even stopped for an instant. The remaining seven were mares. There were no young animals or foals. <laughs> In 1969, three years after that expedition spotted a rare surviving group of Shavalsky horses in the wild, a Mongolian scientist reported a single lone stallion by a natural spring in the Gobi Desert. It was the last truly wild horse seen anywhere on Earth. It sounds strange to say, seeing as many horses live freely around the world outside of human captivity, but the truth is that those horses, like the American Mustang, for example, aren't really wild. They're just feral, the descendants of escaped domestic horses. Shavalsky's horse, also known as the Taki, was the only exception, a subspecies that had never been domesticated. They roamed wild across Eurasia continuously for tens of thousands of years. But sometime after that final sighting in 1969, they went extinct in the wild, a victim of mounting pressures from us humans. And with their disappearance, planet Earth lost the last of its truly wild horses. But the story of the Taki actually has a happy ending. Their extinction in the wild only lasted about 20 years. Today, hundreds have returned to the wild, or more specifically, they have been returned. Ironically, the last wild horses, celebrated for their historic independence from us humans, only survived thanks to a captive breeding program, blurring what it means to be really wild at all. What's more, the return of the talkie forces us to confront what it is we do when conservation actually goes surprisingly well. Once we've saved a species on the brink of extinction and returned it to its home, what happens next? The modern horses that we know today look, move, and act very differently from their wild ancestors and cousins. They are the result of intense artificial selection by us over the last 4,000 years that drastically reshaped them on a physical and behavioral level to become suited for our needs. Equus ferris cabalis is a product of domestication, and it shows in everything from the structure of their spine to the regulation of their mood. But Equus ferris chevalskii, aka the Taki or the Mongolian wild horse, escaped this meddling. They have a different chromosome number than domestic horses, proving both that they're not just feral populations of the domestic horse, and they weren't the source population that we bred it from either. They represent a distinct lineage with their own independent history. And while it's possible that attempts were made to tame them thousands of years ago, the evidence is hotly debated, and we don't have clear proof that those prehistoric attempts were ever successful. Which makes them our last living glimpse into what the once numerous and diverse wild horses of Eurasia were like. They're shorter and stockier than most domestic breeds, and far less comfortable around people. And Taki lookalikes pop up over and over in ancient artwork, some dating back around 30,000 years, which depict wild horses with many of the Taki's most characteristic traits, from its rigid, bristly mane to its typical yellow-brown coat. Almost all other wild lineages vanished as the domestic horse population expanded and replaced them, starting around 4,000 years ago. But the Taki held on in the vast and sparsely populated grassy steppe and semi-arid desert environments of Northeast Asia, surviving into recorded history. In the year 1226, historical Mongolian texts tell of Genghis Khan himself encountering Takis, a man renowned for his legendary mastery of horses. It didn't go well for him. 
The wild talkies spooked his own horse so much that it reared up in alarm and threw him to the ground. The talkies' ancient roots and fierce independence made them an emblem of the prehistoric world before large-scale human modification. A surviving relic of the Ice Age that had remained wild, free, and unchanged, unlike their domestic cousins. And they earned immense significance in Mongolian culture. The name Taki translates to spirit or worthy of worship. Unfortunately, though, Takis grew increasingly scarce over the 20th century, thanks to a mixture of overhunting, increasing competition for resources with livestock, and a series of winters that were unusually harsh on the horses. By the 1960s, reports of them had dwindled to a few sporadic sightings, like the one we began with from 1966, and by the end of that decade, they had vanished entirely. The last wild horses were gone. The last wild horses in the wild that is. See, dozens of Takis had been taken captive and shipped to zoos in Europe and the US over the decades. And some zoos had even been able to successfully breed them in captivity, though they often struggled with inbreeding due to the small number in each zoo's starting population. In the 1950s, it became clear that the survival of the species as a whole would soon be totally reliant on these captive populations, and that zoos needed to work together to save them. In 1959, the first international symposium on the preservation of the Chevalsky's horse was held at the Prague Zoo. It was the first step in developing highly coordinated breeding programs and exchanges that could minimize inbreeding, with the aim of eventually having enough individuals to release back into the wild. And their efforts turned out to be incredibly successful. Right as the very last wild, wild horses were dwindling, the captive wild horses were at the beginning of a baby boom that's still continuing today. Twenty generations of Takis have been meticulously bred so far, involving a total of 8,000 horses across the years, derived from just 12 captive Takis taken from the wild. At time of writing, the total Taki population alive today, which descends from those 12, numbers around 2,000 individuals. Several hundred of them live in free-roaming herds that have now been re-established in multiple countries over the last few decades, including Mongolia, China, Russia, Kazakhstan, and Hungary. These reintroductions have usually happened incrementally with just a few horses at a time, sometimes limited in number mainly by the size of the airplanes available to transport them. And the individual horses themselves are often carefully selected on the basis of their health, genetics, and after being given supervised exposure to semi-wild conditions beforehand. The subspecies was officially downgraded from extinct in the wild to critically endangered in a 2008 assessment after the reintroduced animals began having offspring, and then downgraded again in 2011 to just endangered. After a few decades of absence, the world has wild horses again, even if they feel kind of wild in name only. In the end, this emblem of fierce independence was only spared from total extinction by decades of tightly controlled generational captivity. Sure, it was never technically tamed or domesticated, but the experience it went through had a few similarities. We took it captive and carefully bred it over generations. The wild horses we recreated are, to some degree, just that, the recreation of wildness. Wild, feral, domestic, captive, sometimes species fall somewhere in the cracks between these definitions as their relationship to us gets messy. But as the saying goes, we shouldn't look a gift horse in the mouth. The Taki is back. And however we choose to label them, we should take the conservation win. But what happens next? Sadly, we're not so used to conservation success stories, so we often forget that bringing a species back from the brink is only the first step down a long road. We also have to ensure that their recovery is sustainable. The Takis were lucky as endangered species go. Mongolia and its neighbors are known for having a lot of open space, so there was plenty of potentially protectable habitat still available for herds to be reintroduced into. This is a luxury that many species on the brink of extinction don't have available to them. If their natural habitat has been changed beyond recognition, or if they're simply not charismatic enough to stir us into organized action. And in the case of the Taki, the genetic bottleneck that the subspecies went through in the 20th century means that their long-term recovery will continue to rely on us humans managing their gene pool well into the future. We've been closely monitoring their genetic health for years, tailoring our breeding and reintroduction strategies to maximize their genetic diversity. 
But seeing as the modern population descends from just 12 ancestral Takis, there's only so much we can do on that front. Their limited genetic diversity leaves them vulnerable to multiple threats. Inbreeding is one, of course, but a lack of genetic variation also means that they're less resilient to environmental changes and new diseases that they simply don't have the diversity to adapt to. So in recent years, our stewardship of the Taki has expanded to include a new type of strategic meddling that even most domestic species have never experienced, cloning. Now, cloning can't create individuals with new genetic diversity, but it can bring back lost genetic diversity from past individuals. Two Takis were successfully cloned in the early 2020s using cryopreserved cells stored at the Frozen Zoo, one of the collections in the San Diego Zoo Wildlife Alliance's Wildlife Biodiversity Bank. It's the world's first large-scale biobank for the living cells and gametes of endangered species. Both clones were of a single stallion who had died in 1998 without being used much in the breeding program, and whose genome contained a trove of variation missing from the modern population. Conservationists hope that his clones will inject a fresh dose of genetic diversity that will help rescue the gene pool of the subspecies as a whole. While the story of the Taki's return is still far from over, it has already established itself as one of the most radical, ambitious, and successful conservation efforts in modern history. Saving the last wild horses meant turning them into one of the most intensely managed animal lineages ever, a high price for a famously independent species to pay. But one that I think we can all agree is worth it, to have the Takis roaming our planet once more. Endlings is filmed in the Harry Plumley studio and was made possible by hundreds of you who supported us on Kickstarter. Thank you so very much. We really could not have done this without you. We'd like to thank the San Diego Zoo Wildlife Alliance for letting us use their images in this episode. <laughs>